Hi, Michaela. Uh, welcome to the uh, this little art show we've got going on. Hi, Bonnie. Nice to see you all the way from Australia. Now, where where about exactly do you live? I live in Brighton, UK. Okay, oh, which is by the sea, about sixty miles from London. It's like a mini London by the sea. <laughs> hey. because, yeah. Okay. Well, uh, okay. Well, show us uh, the next painting. Okay. This is a little one that is based um, on Aylesbury, which is a huge. We have a lot of Neolithic stone circles in um, England, and it's just about basically a lot of people see orb-like things late at night around these stone circles. So there's, it's showing the, you know, the, the orbs that come through. Um, it's also showing about the sleeping energies underneath the trees at Ellsbury. There's a group of trees in this particular Neolithic site that are very strange and they've got lots of roots that come off them and everything like that. And I like to hang around in these sacred sites at night and experience these things because I'm just fascinated by the energies and the healing that you can have from these great stones and trying to fathom out what they really were and and uh, all the, 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 the different things that I hear about stones. The fact that Stonehenge is another site, the most famous one, but how it isn't really, the stones aren't placed in the places they're supposed to be because they moved all the stones around in the late 60s. So their wow, English heritage is basically said that's uh, kept it's on the internet. You can find it, folks, if you want to look it up. But they've moved the stones around somewhat and dug it all up before people started. Just at the point before people started getting interested in hippie festivals. Anyway, so they've basically moved those sites around, and that, obviously stones get naturally moved around by farmers and all of that over the years. But yeah, it's just trying to highlight the fact that you know, come and see these stones, hang out with these stones feel the energy of the earth mother giving birth every season to the, all the nature and everything like that and all the energies that are we don't actually know what these things really are yeah we have we've not been educated and if they do know they're not letting us know but i anybody that's got any kind of anything about them if they sit there for a while they will connect with these stones they will connect with the ley lines that are underneath them because they're, they're, they're like the Great Pyramid, they're, both, they're built on ley lines and uh, there's a reason for it and it's part of the grid that's the Christ Consciousness grid across our planet and um, you often, you know, the thing is the military know that and they've built bases on these grid points as well because it's a good way of disrupting us and keeping us in a warlike way there's some of these sacred sites are still there and just by being on them and connecting them and the powerfulness that we actually are, because we are a part of this grid, and if we really believe in the way that we can manifest these energies, just by connecting with it, it helps this planet heal. So if this painting is seen by somebody that wouldn't normally think about it, they go, why is the baby under there? And they go, why are these orb things? What does it all mean? And it's a full moon. Just like maybe that might say, well, one day they might subconsciously just end up going there, uh, sitting there at night trying to connect with all these things. That's amazing. Um, yeah, because I mean, I know they do rituals as well on the ley line crossings to to spread their energy and to change the frequency of the planet. This is one that I've never almost finished. And it's basically David Bowie is a very young man with, and you can tell it's him, but if you know David Bowie well, he's got one eye, different colours. Um, and basically it's based on a vision I had at Glastonbury in about 1988. And it was, they had a pyramid stage at that point in Glastonbury and the Bundu boys came on, I came up. <laughs> Uh, the whole of the top of the the the, the um, pyramid broke open, and a spaceship flew through. And at that time, I got messages that I was to try to do art at some point. Um, I got messages that 
there was a, an extraterrestrial life out there. And it took me all of these years to find the right situation and input that came to me sort of from the, the, the ether about the stories. And now is very now, we would, on the internet these days, you've got loads and loads of things about the Anunnaki, hidden history, all of those things, yeah? And um, ancient alien spacecraft. So basically, because I was very fond of science fiction as a child and man who fell to earth, David Bowie was the, first, the perfect muse for it. Then I wanted to bring in my story from Glastonbury all those years ago about the spaceship and the cracking universe. Um, also, I wanted to just to bring into people's consciousness the fact that I don't think that we are all just one species. I think that we're mucked around with somewhat. And the fact that um, we've got skulls all over the world, with elongated skulls that have been hidden. Also, I think that it, we're ignorant to think that the old cultures um, were less advanced than we are. And I think they've hidden that because they want to keep technologies hidden from us because it's to their profit, us not to have any control of energy. We, we were crushed when we were played around with in somewhat, and um, we don't need a lot of the pills and everything that we're told we need. We don't need that, but we're put into a position where we have to take it because we've been enslaved so many thousands of years now, we're just used to it. And it's, you know, that's the problem. I mean, there was a great, they worshipped Saturn in Egyptian times, and I, I believe the Masons still do worship Saturn. And a lot of interesting things have been said about Saturn in the fact that there's a great big huge supercomputer up there that's beaming out stuff that keeps us entrapped in this way of thinking that we can't break out of, so that it keeps us entrapped. And yeah. one day... I mean, it yeah, will probably David get. Writes, yeah, it talks about the Saturn moon matrix, and that yeah. they, they 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 emanate a frequency from Saturn, which helps to keep this planet uh, vibrationally in a certain state. That's correct. And then they they continue to do that with the type of music we hear, because the people can controlling the arts, for one thing, and controlling music and what sounds we hear. Those vibrations are kept even more. At a certain level so and that only there was a grid okay there's also a grid around a, a sort of grid that all the big military bases are built on where the, the sort of ley lines of the earth are kept from basically causing this grid to open which causes our consciousness to lift to a higher level so anyway these things were put in place thousands of years ago and a lot wasn't 5,000 years ago, more like 25,000 years ago, because our history's a lie. And the reason they want our planet is because there's gold on it. So, I mean, the wars of gold tip to the Great Pyramid. So I put the gold tip up there. They would, there's a spaceship, it's come to remove the gold <laughs> and take it back to wherever it goes. And um, I don't know, that's this, it's this, it's, it's basically, Okay, you better know about the technique I've used as well. The technique that I've used is Mish technique, um, and I've gone in with spectral colours, um, burnt spruce styly. So um, I also have been on the guidance. Lawrence gave me advice, Lawrence Kanur, and also Daniel Moranti's given me advice on this painting. They're my basically my masters, and um, then uh, I just feel very much that I've created something here that's telling the truth and I just think by putting this type of visionary art out often visionary art or any kind of art is the first point of call to change people's minds about things like when I started doing yoga the first thing I saw was a picture of Ganesh you know the elephant god so maybe people who've got closed minds will see this painting years to come on floating around on the internet and um think a little bit about what they're being taught in school and maybe just by that they might look something else up and it might cause you know them 
to research something that they wouldn't normally research, which might cause a spark to break them free from the control as much as is possible. Because some days it's very hard to break free, free, free from the control because they use so much fear in all the media and we get crushed back down again or if something happens and we're emotionally disturbed, it's difficult to move freely because there's so many things being beamed at us all the time to stop that happening. So it's just my little bit of way of helping people wake up a little bit, that's all, <laughs> in a very sort of like controlled world. Yes, and gold as well, just going back to what you said before, is also very, very interesting when you said they've come down here to mine the gold because it's such a multi-dimensional um, uh, substance, you know, and apparently it's made from solidified sunlight, but um, anyway, just back to the painting, I mean, do you think that uh, the visionary art can, uh, well, obviously you do, but do you think visionary art can, in general, help awaken consciousness, um, and also do you think it's being suppressed? Um, I think it definitely can awaken consciousness in the same way that yoga or meditation can waken consciousness. I think it is um, definitely being suppressed and is definitely being suppressed in the UK um, by certain huge institutions such as Saatchi who run advertising for the Conservative government. Um, I think that they're fearful of this type of art waking people up so they tend to push a lot of contemporary modern art that disturbs the mind rather than opens the mind so it's just it's very difficult for you to get any visionary art in any big galleries or auction houses in um, the UK anyway at the moment and because of the corruption that is in the art world and it, you know and if certain people say certain people can make it and not others not necessarily because of their talent just because they're in the right circles or it's useful to them is just the way it is. I mean, I've, I've done a lot to find out why visionary art is not really hitting it here. We don't have a, a, an all year round festival scene, that's for sure, which doesn't help. It gets very cold in the winter, so there's not much. People end up starving and going back to work before they make it in visionary art. You have to really do it for the love and really keep at it and be so passionate about it that you just don't want to give up because you are kind of driven to do visionary art as some sort of a mission. It's sort of like you're almost born to it because you, you've been you've reincarnated here to try and wake people up and art's one of the ways, you know, it's the easiest way. And if we were just in our natural form without all these horrible things suppressing us, we would probably be just be showing how everybody to paint, to heal, to just probably we we could levitate but we're just so crushed we can't so it's really important that no matter what if you've been given a calling to do visionary art that you do it no matter whether it makes you money or not you have to have to buckle down and do a bar job well that's how it goes you know you've got to get that art out because the planet will be screwed if we don't literally <laughs> it's like we're we, we're talking like emergency level, get that visionary art out now. Yeah, because even by looking at certain artworks, I mean, of course, the mind works with uh, pictures. So pictures can have a direct Im impact on on our subconscious mind. Um, and also a, a lot of visionary art kind of triggers one's, one's expansion outside of the box. Um, on, on many different levels, you know, even th thinking about creative solutions to problems, thinking about things that you've never thought about before, um, and yeah, just giving people a, a, a different perspective, and, and, and that could be um, dangerous for if the elites, or whatever you want to call them, are obviously trying to control people's thinking. No, I mean, yeah, I mean, obviously, it's quite a well-known documented fact that the CIA, you know, was ex basically trying to control abstract expressionism during the Cold War. And, you know, that they found, I think, at that point. But art has always been a, a, a thing that um, people get upset about because the artist often will speak out 
I mean, look what happened during the war. Hitler couldn't get into the Vienna Academy. So what did he come along and do? Blew it up during the Second World War because he tried three times or something like that to get in and he couldn't. So art is, you know, art is something, you know, you can always spray paint a wall, you know, and say something with art. And uh, the thing is they keep, when you go to art college these days, these days, if you start doing visionary art in a state-run art college, you know, if you start talking about visionary art and experiences visualization in altered states of consciousness, they tell you that it's a police matter. And if you continue writing about that in your essays and drawing those type of pictures, that you possibly might have to leave the art college. So it's been properly repressed in this country. Well, I'll tell you something, Michaela. My painting is quite technical or whatever, visionary art, imaginary realism. I failed painting twice. So, and a lot of the uh, top art students were doing more abstract sort of stuff. Um, and I was supposedly in one of the best arts school, school art schools um, in South Africa, anyway. Um, so, um, and also, uh, you set up some kind of a exhibition or gallery yourself. For visionary artists how long have you been doing that for it's about a year and a half now and what the reason i did it was because i went around all the major art shows um to find out to see some visionary art i came back thoroughly sort of excited about being involved in this movement about doing these things with the academy in vienna and all the things that they do and so why well, how am i going to sell these this work then so off i trotted around all the major art shows and galleries and i couldn't find any visionary art so I was absolutely shocked and horrified. And uh, then I thought, well, well, as ever, I'll start doing it myself then. <laughs> you know, and uh, at least that's how it happened. And it's just to, to, it's more to raise awareness. And I know I'm starting from scratch really here because not a lot of people have managed to get going here. They've always had to leave the country in the end and go to Bali and Australia and America and Vienna and everywhere like that. And they, if they stayed here, they probably wouldn't want to eat very much. So I understand why, but I'm, I'm of an age where I probably won't shoot across the world so much. So I'm in a position where I will fight the good fight on this territory to try and get it going the best I can. I just have to hope that the bigger names from all around the world get their butts to the UK and do things here because the more that come, the more people, the more it will happen, you know, the bigger names, because they have to run away, unfortunately, to feed themselves. It's very rather sad. <laughs> I suppose when I was a child, I used to watch all sorts of sci-fi, sci-fi nut as a child, probably for a good reason, because I know there's something more to the universe. And I used to love Doctor Who. But what used to bug the pants off me during my childhood was they were always male. <laughs> and I used to think, Oh, she should be a female Doctor Who. So I thought, how can I manifest this? I'm way too old to be a Doctor Who, and I'm well aware of that. Anyway, so I started to manifest this painting, and lo and behold, out of the Matrix came a female Doctor Who. So it was well worth putting the concentration into this painting, because we now have a female Doctor Who. I never intended it to be me, because of my age, and I'm not an actress, but it is happening. So it just shows that the power of art can make things manifest on this plane, as far as I'm concerned. I feel fairly sure that uh, she's now wandering around the BBC with her sonic screwdriver. <laughs> <laughs> so you say uh, you've done courses or workshops with Amanda Sage and Daniel Moranti. So, so how many in general, would you say you're self-taught or would you say you've, you know, you've had a lot of instruction from other artists or did you go to art school, etc., etc.? I went to art school and I was doing the foundation probably when my son, when I was about 30, I went to art school. I could have gone before, but I was traveling the world and everything like that. And I started painting ethereal art and got told off and got told off by the fine arts. She said, you're not coming into fine art through this foundation because you're painting ethereal rubbish, basically. So I was completely crushed, and um, they pushed me into textile design. So I ended up going to a college to do textile design. Um, halfway through the course, I got fed up with it, um, tried to get into the fine art department, 
and went into the fine art department and it was completely there was nobody there you were just basically left to get on with it not really given much tuition about oil painting or anything and it was more to do with contemporary art they weren't teaching you what I wanted to know about how to mix pigments, how to do tempera, how to do the things that the old masters did, how to do art basically that requires intelligence <laughs> and a lot of effort. They only wanted to teach us um, sort of rubbish really, that's not the things I wanted to paint. So I became disillusioned and left with a huge debt, <laughs> which I'm still paying off. <laughs> that is phenomenal. That is phenomenal because, uh, I, I mean, I used to run an art school and I had a whole bunch of students there at one point. At my art school, um, they were fine arts students and they said they weren't teaching them anything in the fine arts department. So yeah. I don't know. I mean, it boggles my mind. But... Um, so skill is not very revered, seems to be not very revered in the contemporary art world. Um, anyway, okay. It's well, sad, it's very, very sad. I think it's it's sad, it's, it's a sad state of affairs. And you're told at art college these days, and I've spoken to some young girls that are actually, they're trying to do short courses in the visionary art movement, but they have to be staying at university because that's where the parents want them in art college. And they're told that don't don't you can carry on doing this degree, but don't bother trying to get do the arts. You're never going to make any money. Get a job within the arts in an administrative level. So. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. That's that's like, amazing. That's amazing because I mean there is a stereotype that one's never going to make money at being an artist. Well, I suppose it depends what type of artist you are as well. Like if you cater to the system, you'd probably get a bit further ahead but um anyway okay well let's have a look at some of your other paintings okay okay there's one here that isn't is um a decalcomania it's a small one that's complete and it's based on the colors of psilocybin and walking through a forest and basically suddenly the little entities of the forest popping out at you. And what I liked about doing a decalcomania in oil mesh technique, how I was taught with Daniel Moranti taught me how to do this. And it's one of the best things I ever got taught because I love the little characters that come out in um, decalcomania. So these little beasties, you can see them came out to me as I did this little mesh technique and it was quite a fast painting considering all of it and the little spores of the mushrooms, the sacred sacraments all flushing down there to grow more little mushrooms to help these little creatures manifest for us because we can't really see them unless we've had something because we just blind to them in the forest. So that was about that. So that's more of a sort of no, carry on. Little, you know, these, no, that's just that one's about. It's more to do with an experience. And they actually, when they manifest through the decalcomania, which is done by the suction technique, or moving implements around in the oil glazes and then finding their little faces and then bringing the egg temper in to bring their little faces and their little bodies out. And it's like little entities popping out to talk to you to show you that, you know, there's so many different dimensions in our reality that we just aren't able to see. And it just sort of like helps, if this helps people realise that, then I hope I've done something for people. It's like the little uh, nature spirits on the, uh, yeah, the second, the second, second dimension. Um, yeah. And there's, well, there's little pixies in, pixies in there as well. But uh, yeah, that was a, one of the quicker ones. But um, a lot of people see it as quite a druggy painting. But it's not a druggy painting when you think that if we hadn't have taken mushrooms, Soma, we wouldn't have any, you know, this religion stuff and all of these things came from mushrooms. And I think that people need to realize that that sacrament is a holy sacrament, like, um, like in cannabis or anything like that. But 
people take all these because we're in a culture and a world that likes to mess our brains up we're not shown that way. We're shown that you have to take loads of it all the time or get messed up on it. We're not educated in a way that we appreciate these things so that we do them correctly. We're not allowed, we're not afforded that education almost on purpose because it makes sense, I suppose, to the powers that be to mess people up a little bit more with it. You know, if our energies are off, especially at festivals and stuff like that, there's lots of sloosh vibration running around for them to suck up. From us so it's kind of useful to them for some entities to stay manifested here they shouldn't really be here if you understand what I'm saying um, absolutely um, yes and and people weren't taught how to take them respectfully and you know to do what they need to, to do to keep themselves safe because sometimes when you take these things you open up to other dimensions um, which which can which is great if you do it you know ceremoniously and respectfully and and with the correct teachers and psychic protection but if you just take things at a party you know you could open yourself up to anything you know, and any, the sad thing is anything yeah any kind of energies you know which can just get attached to you and then they can you know b ruin your life make you ill I mean, this is the problem, and as long as they don't allow it to be legalized and to people to get educated like that, many young people's lives will be ruined for absolutely ever. They carry those entities around them, feeding off them. They'll just be little robots for these entities as they get more and more manipulated by an iller and iller and iller. Exactly. exactly. But that's not... These happy little creatures are there to sort of say, this doesn't have to be like that. <laughs> Just to, and hopefully, if we keep promoting these things and spreading the word that, you know, some young people will watch these videos and realize that you shouldn't just be necking like 100 mushrooms at a, a festival and then and then get left by your friends in a muddy field who, who think, oh, look at, look at Stevie, he's on the floor, what a mess, ha, 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 not hanging out with him anymore, ha, 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 ha. And all that kind of stuff will stop. And poor old Stevie won't end up half mad after the festival. But, you know, that's, a that's not the real name of anybody, but it's just, you know, I'm just trying to say the sort of scenarios that happen. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> okay. All right. This is um, another psychedelic one that I'm working with, the Calcomania. And this is taking the colours grading up it's it's um this one i'm working in casein not egg tempera um yeah I, I pop into in and out of it is taking rather longer than i thought it would take um because there's so much much going on and so many layers to build up i suppose you've got a bit of lucy in the sky with diamonds coming in there and it's like a, a sea of psychedelia and um that's, but you know it's it's a happy sort of world of um, decalcomania, madness with all the different things popping up here and there, little mushrooms having a party there and uh, you know you've got a man ushering away his child from all this going on here and there's just lots of going on and it's a very instinctual piece and um, I'm liking working with casein, it's very different from the egg temper, I find it a bit more clumpy but it's getting there and but I think it's going to take me probably be about a year to do because of fitting it in around things and being so much going on in it. But I pop in and out every now and again and then I do the odd bit of glaze and then I build it up again. But it's mainly very psychedelic piece um, based on more and more about, I suppose, that, that level when you take LSD where you literally are in it rather than you're seeing the psychedelic experience. You've got the, you're lying there in the dark and experiencing it fully so it's based around that I guess but they're not entities that are based on what I've seen they're just ones that have popped out to me through the decalcomania I guess what I'm trying to show is that if you are going to have that experience take it in a controlled environment and enjoy the ride <laughs> try not to be <laughs> try, try not to be in the middle of a techno club with or in the middle of a mosh pit 
coming up on LSD, do it somewhere safe, kids. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, more so than, spoke, yeah. Do you work on more than one painting at a time, or do you only focus on, you know, limited amount of things? Um, I've got quite a lot going all at once because of being in the textile sort of stream of things, and for so long I've got quite a lot of stuff that was repressed to get out. So there's there's, there's quite a number going at the same time, and I'm about to start another one. So. But I'm, I've got a sort of like a two-year plan with getting them all finished and to add a couple of others. I want to go a bit bigger, but then I want to get some of these finished before I start launching into projects. I don't like having loads of unfinished projects about because it, I think that that can make the artists I know that do that get quite frustrated about these projects that they have to leave all over the place. And I, I don't want to have to do that if I can. Um, I want to get as much done before I die. <laughs> as I can and uh, it's very important that I push this stuff out because um, it's important work so you know not it's not a, it's not about the money to me it's about getting it out there on the internet people seeing it and um, you know it's uh, so that people don't have these negative views of, of um, different subcultures you know exactly This is, a, I did a course, lovely Autumn Sky Morrison. This painting is not finished. Um, it's me, she's a, an acrylic expert, and she's, you know, like one of the great visionaries. She's been around for a while, like a, all the others that I've been training under, and like yourself, Bonnie. So she's, um, here she taught, we did um, a whole course on glazing, because usually I've working, been working with oil, and I wanted to learn how to manipulate acrylics because of the fact that I've always found them a bit flat. So with this painting, I did a portrait of myself with my um, throat chakra emanating to try and encourage me to talk clearly and to, from the thoughts that I have in my head that manifest, to try and have the speech that comes out to be clear and concise. That was an absolute journey. <laughs> um, and it's, it's so amazing also just to hear, you know, the the meaning behind the paintings or just, you know, a bit of an explanation. It just gives you so much of an insight into the artist, you know, rather than just just seeing the work. Um, abs just awesome. Um, yeah, you must doing these videos because you get to hear all these journeys from people it must be amazing um absolutely absolutely i and mean it's like a documentation in the history of art of visionary art and if you weren't doing this bonnie it wouldn't be documented i i, I like to hear other artists perspectives but we also want to have a perspective on the consciousness that made the painting to help people even more get outside the box and also uh, michaela was there Anything else um, that you wanted to add? Um, or keep in touch with looking at um, the Facebook page for House of Alchemy, which is the, the group that I run. Um, we do basically exhibitions and workshops in the UK to raise awareness about visionary art. And um, we, so the intention is to do more, to spread the word and to get more people interested in visionary art and to try and encourage everybody that they can paint whatever age they are um that it's not it is is it a god there's no god given given gift it is a gift that can be given to anyone from dedicated teachers uh where can people see more of your work i mean do you have a website or yeah i have um pereira.net is my website or if you just go on to Michaela Pereira on Facebook or House of Alchemy you'll be able to find my work. Well Michaela that was truly enlightening that was next level so thank you so much for sharing all those insights and perspectives and your work with us and uh, hope to see you again soon. Yeah thank you Bonnie and thank you for all you do for the visionary art movement. Bon chanty. <laughs>